All right, the second short review of the day. We got my Deer Hunter t-shirt that looks fucking badass as shit, at least to me, because I'm a movie person, and this m movie means a lot to me, and most people would probably just stare at the t-shirt and say, why is that guy, like, holding a gun to his head? And I'm like, fuck you, you haven't seen the Russian roulette scene. You should go and see it. Go and see it, because it's great. Ah, uh, okay. My dinner with Andre. I was very hesitant when I was when I decided to watch this film because I heard of it many many times, mostly from one particular critic, um, and that critic was is, was obviously Roger Ebert, who fucking adored this movie. Like this was one of his favorite films, not only of the eighties but probably of all time. And all I knew about the film was that. The guy from, like, like George Wallace, is that his name? Like, the guy from The Princess Bride. That guy's in this movie. Um, and it's basically... The whole film is basically this one dinner. It's one big, long, fucking conversation about existentialism and the world and being woke and being open-minded and being against the bullshit of life and living, and cynicism, and all that you know, New Yorkian, pretentious, superfluous, ostentatious bullshit. And the thing is, I'm kind of like that, so I decided maybe I'll like it. And, like, I'm the kind of person who likes reading books like, um, like Franny and Zoe by J.D. Salinger. And yes, n that, J not the fucking catcher, that's a great book too, but... I read other Salinger books, motherfucker. I'm not your average high school kid who's like, I read Salinger, then the only book he's read, like, is The Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, good for you, motherfucker. Um, but Franny is always one of my favorite books. And that book basically is, like, 200 pages, and the whole book is constructed of four, four long, 50-page-long conversations. So I like these kind of self-indulgent overly analytic conversa conversation pieces, when, whether it's in film form, whether it's in theater form, whether it's in literary form, whether it's in music form, whatever. Like, I like it as long as it's interesting. And that really is how this film should work. The conversation can be as long as it wants, wants to be, as long as it is interesting so the film starts and you see the george wallace guy i can't remember his name right now he's just like walking the street walking in the streets and the first sign of a flaw you just see it an inner monologue you hear an, a narration of the guy's inner monologue talking about his life how he's trying to live how he's trying to be an actor and writer at the same time but nobody's get buying his scripts and nobody's hiring him as an actor and it's just this self-indulgent cynical like that generic woody allen shit that's going on and you see these minimal filmmaking done like he's just walking in the streets and the camera's kind of shaky he's he's on the metro and the camera's kind of shaky it's in his face and he's talking about he's gonna have this dinner with this guy and it's so self-indulgent, it's so cynical, that it actually sets the mood perfectly for the rest of the film. I didn't, I thought, when I first saw this bit, I thought it was terrible. But as the film went on, and when we got into the conversation, and as the film just goes into the conversation, I realized that beginning really does set the tone for the film kind of perfectly. And even though I still think it's very flawed, I think it's a very clumsy way to get into the mood... It's, it was still effective, so I can't really say too, too many things that's bad about it. And then we get into the dinner scene. Now, thankfully, as we get really deep into the conversation, the inner monologue and the narration disappears, and it only appears right at the end, which is a very good choice. If the narration was still going on in, in the midst of the conversation, I would have been probably really pissed. Um, and as the conversation goes on, at first, you hear this... Andre, Andre guys, you know, stories, how he went into this Polish forest and he danced with these women and taught them acting or improv or some shit, maybe like they 
got they got into the level two of improv or some bullshit like that and he talks about this idea of life and how everybody's just clouded in their own misery and their own emotions and they don't know when to say things they don't know how to be direct so they're direct in wrong wrong places and they're indirect in other wrong places and the more you watch the film and the more you listen to the conversation the more you slightly start to realize, and this is just my opinion, and I've read Roger Ebert's review, I've watched so many reviews of this film just to understand if I got some, if I missed something. Because, you know, I'm young. I haven't experienced too much misery in my life. And sure, I have a mental illness, but that doesn't mean I have, like, life experience misery. It's just that I'm sad once in a while because my brain and my heart's kind of dumb. So, hormone-wise or whatever. So, I want to understand this film. Because the core idea and the core message and the core conversation that, that was that's really go going on in this film is kind of the conversation that I probably would have um, with other people or just with myself when I'm just alone. And, like, alone. And, f fuck. <laughs> um, but here's the problem. The conversation they have is not original. It's not an original conversation. The idea of trying to be an awakened person, an alerted person, a person who's kind of like psychologically and mentally above and like watching the ground below and becoming more aware of oneself and one's surroundings and understanding that there are so many phonies in life and that comfort really delusions you and that you should become one with the world not just a part of it and all this idea of existentialism and be about being alive and the purpose of being alive all this has been done much more effectively in other films like you can just watch a few Woody Allen movies hell Ingmar Bergman Watch just a few of Ingmar Bergman's films. Like, he would take, like, a part of that conversation, uh, of this conversation in this film, and he would just expand it and make this rural picture of an amazing film. The Seven, the Seven Seal probably, like, deals with most of the conversation of this film. In fact, most of the conversation in this film, considering that it's, like, the, the Polish forest and whatnot, it's probably really, really heavily influenced by Ingmar Bergman's work. And as the conversation goes on, although the themes are interesting, you kind of realize maybe this kind of conversation is not really suited for film, or at least this long of a conversation, this self-indulgent of a conversation. And the only interesting bits of the film is how the main character actually kind of denies and disagrees with Andre's conversations, his ideas of being awake. Because Andre kind of lives in his, to, a, to some realists, he kind of lives in his own fantasy world. He desires this extremely, you know, utopia-esque world where everybody's awake, everybody's honest, everybody's, everybody understands who they are, and everybody's dancing and enjoying art and seeing the world as a happy place. But George Wallace... The, the, the main character, he's poor. Like, Andre Andre is rich. He's successful and he's rich. So maybe he has the... Um, what's that? He has the money. He has enough... He has less worries about the real world, so he has new worries about the world that most people don't really think about. But the main character, he doesn't have enough money. He doesn't have a job. He wants to be successful, but he's not. So he's surrounded with these real problems. And because he's so surrounded with these real problems, he doesn't agree with Andre's utopia world. Because for most people, they have to solve these problems first before they even think about those pretentious problems about being awake and all that. So as the conversation goes on, that conflict becomes more heightened. The tension becomes higher. And that's what makes the conversation more interesting. At the beginning, it really isn't. When they, when they agree, it's probably the most boring part of the film. But when they start to disagree... Oh, fuck. Around the last 40 minutes... 
when they start to disagree, that's when the film starts to get interesting. Unfortunately, that's the last 40 minutes, and by that point, you're just kind of like, okay, existentialism, you're miserable, you want to fucking die, just get to the fucking point! But then you get to the conflict, and you're like, okay, now there's an actual discussion. Now they're showing more human side. Not Now the conversation is not just, not just one side. Mo the first half of the film, most of the time, Andre is speaking. The main character is just asking him questions. Andre's mostly talking about his life, what's been going on. And when they actually get into what Andre learned through these experiences and what he thinks about the world now, and that the main character disagrees with this, this discussion, this conflict makes everything more interesting. And what makes the film more, slightly more interesting than it was before is the ending. Because in the end, they kind of disagree. They end disagreeing. They don't come to a resolution. But Andre still focuses on the fact that the world is a very simple place. And that real problems may look may make the world seem like a more convoluted and complicated and mostly miserable place. But the world is a very simple and happy place. And if you really trace your life, it's most you will find that most of the things that were really important to you, or at least the things that you remember, are constructed of those simple happy things. And maybe when a person can really see beyond the real problems, he can understand his point of view, Andre's point of view, the point of view of trying to find those simple things and trying to create a life with those things and try to create a better world with those things. And the main character, you know, the dinner's over, he treats himself to a little cab to go home. He could have easily walked, but he he, tr he goes on a cab, and he looks outside, and he sees that one store when he, when he, where he used to drink like ice cream soda after school. That was the store when he, where, he, where his dad bought him a bag, and he realizes that Andre's right. He might not be right with everything, but he's definitely right when he says life is constructed of simple things, and those are the important things, and if people really focus on those things, the world wouldn't be as miserable as it is. If people are more instinctive about their happiness and about their sadness and about their emotions, maybe the world wouldn't be this miserable and complicated and overly fetishizing authenticity and all that bullshit. And as the main character looks around him, and he, when he realizes that Andre's words are right, he sounds more... He sounds slightly more contemplative. And he sounds slightly more satisfied. And although his real problems are still there, he seems to understand that maybe this will all pass and maybe it's not as big and as miserable and as, you know, energy inducing as they seem to be. So at the end, the film ends you on an interesting note. The film ends you on a very contemplative note. Is the whole experience fun? No, some pe some parts of the film kind of lags. Like like I said, the introduction of the film is very clumsy. Um, the first half of the conversation is just... At first it's, in it's interesting, but then it just gets so boring. But when they finally bring a conflict into the conversation, and when that conflict actually makes the main character grow as a, grow as a person, and as you go along this conflict, you real and as you realize you have you also have an opinion on what the main character thinks and what Andre thinks, the film becomes more of this conversation piece. It feels more interactive because the theme and the conversations and the opinions are so open and it's not just one side it's not trying to force you this idea it's trying to show you these two sides and as the film goes on with that narrative the film becomes interesting and it ends on an interesting note so i would say just for that sake the film's worth a watch it's pretty good so 3.5 for that motherfucker. Louis Maul, you done it again, you Atlantic City riding piece of shit. Um, fuck, he's shorter than me, so I can call him a piece of shit if I want to. Um, 
My dinner with Andre, 3.5 out of the 4. Get your cynical hats on because it's worth a ride. Um, I hate using those. I hate pe when people say, like, it's a ride, man! Fucking kill themselves. It's so this is over. Done. Bye.